The English Channel Tunnel, often referred to as the Euro Tunnel, is considered the seventh wonder of the world, built by humans in the 20th century. Constructing tunnels through mountains or underground seems relatively simple compared to the engineering marvel of this channel tunnel. The English Channel Tunnel, a 50-kilometer long structure, was built beneath seawater. On the world map, it connects France and the United Kingdom. To link these two countries, the Channel Tunnel was constructed under the sea allowing high-speed trains to travel at speeds of up to 160 kilometers per hour. This ambitious project was not directly funded by the government, but was financed through public funding, making it the costliest engineering project to date. With a total cost of approximately £9 billion in 1994, even before construction began, detailed planning ensured that the tunnel was designed specifically for the type of transportation it would accommodate. After an agreement between the UK and French governments, a geological investigation was conducted. The study revealed multiple layers of soil beneath the seabed. The topmost layer was composed of grey chalk, which contained numerous cracks due to water infiltration, making it unsuitable for tunneling. Beneath this layer was another, more stable layer called chalk marl. This layer was less permeable, with almost negligible cracks, making it a better option for tunneling. Chalk marl primarily composed of calcium carbonate, is even used in schools today. However, this stone is not as strong as chalk stone, making it somewhat vulnerable to the immense pressure of seawater. Despite its limitations, chalk marl was deemed the safest layer available. It is located 35 to 45 meters below the seabed. In 1988, when construction of the tunnel began, both countries decided to dig from their respective sides and meet at a central point. Interestingly, three parallel tunnels were to be built simultaneously. Two railway tunnels and one service tunnel, all constructed together. For this purpose, a specialized machine known as the Tunnel Boring Machine, or the TBM, was developed. The TBM features cutting discs at its head, designed to excavate soil efficiently. You can learn more about the detailed working of the TBM through the video link provided in the description. The diameter of each railway tunnel was 7.6 meters, while the service tunnel in the center measured 4.8 meters in diameter. Construction began with the service tunnel, which was placed slightly ahead of the railway tunnels. This allowed geological investigations to be conducted for the two main railway tunnels alongside the service tunnel. The total length of the tunnel is 50 kilometers, with 38 kilometers running beneath the seabed. However, as soon as the TBM reached below the seabed, significant challenges began to emerge. The cutter head of the TBM excavates the chalk marl, and with the help of a screw conveyor, the waste material is transported to a conveyor belt, which then carries it out of the tunnel. Despite the machine operating smoothly, the tunnel unexpectedly collapsed. This sudden collapse posed one of the biggest challenges for the engineers. The TBM is used for earth pressure balancing in the Euro Tunnel, a critical requirement due to the immense water pressure beneath the sea. Once excavation for the tunnel begins, it cannot be halted midway. The entire tunnel must be constructed continuously to ensure stability. The head of the TBM endures tremendous water pressure, and just behind it lies the excavation chamber, where the chalk marl waste is temporarily stored after being cut. To understand the balancing process, imagine the TBM head is subjected to two bars of water pressure, for stability, the TBM head must maintain an equivalent two-bar pressure on the face of the tunnel. Failing to do so would result in the tunnel collapsing. To achieve this balance, the excavation chamber is filled with chalk marl waste, which helps the TBM head counteract the external water pressure effectively. When the pressure in the excavation chamber exceeds two bar, the excess chalk marl is removed via the rotary screw conveyor. This waste is then transported to a conveyor belt, which carries it to the machine's exit, where it is finally loaded onto trucks and trains for disposal. Surprisingly, despite balancing the pressure, the tunnel collapsed again, introducing challenge number two. While pressure on the front side was managed, leaving the tunnel unfinished posed a significant risk. Warning: Under water pressure, cracks would begin to form in the soil, ultimately leading to the tunnel's collapse. To address this, it was crucial to proceed with constructing a stable structure immediately after excavation. For this purpose, specifically designed reinforced concrete rings were used. 
These rings contained iron rods and were significantly heavier than those used in nuclear power plants. The heavy concrete blocks were transported to the machine, where segment erectors, located behind the machine's head, lifted them one by one to assemble the tunnel lining. Once a complete ring was constructed, thrust cylinders were employed to push the TBM head forward, ensuring it remained aligned on the intended tunnel path. This process, known as tunnel lining, involves using hydraulic thrust cylinders to maintain the TBM's position as it progresses through the tunnel. However, if you look closely, another problem arises. A small gap forms between the completed tunnel and the TBM head. If cracks develop in the chalk marl and water begins to seep through, it could damage the TBM's electronics or even cause the tunnel to collapse. To address this, a protective shield is installed around the TBM. This shield acts as a barrier safeguarding the tunnel and preventing collapse during the construction process. New challenges emerged once again. The TBM on the UK side was operating at a good speed, but the French side faced significant difficulties. While the depth of the TBM was manageable, the chalk marl presented a major obstacle. On the French side, numerous cracks in the chalk marl created a muddy environment, which further increased water pressure. Under these conditions, while the TBM could still function, the risk of tunnel collapse was extremely high. To address this issue, the French team used a slurry TBM. This machine mixed bentonite, clay, water, and polymer, and injected the mixture under pressure into the tunnel face from the TBM's cutter head. This slurry filled the cracks, effectively stopping the water leakage. Additionally, the mixture formed a filter cake on the TBM's front face, sealing the cracks and eliminating the water ingress problem entirely. With the water leakage resolved, the TBM head could resume cutting, and the machine advanced smoothly. On the UK and French sides, different mechanisms were employed to secure the concrete blocks. On one side, a locking mechanism was utilized, while on the other side, the blocks were tightened with bolts. Once again, the concrete rings presented a challenge. Although water leakage was temporarily halted to facilitate construction, Significant gaps remain between the concrete rings, allowing water to seep through. To address this issue, the neoprene and grout-sealed bolted lining was implemented. As the TBM moved forward, its shield created slight gaps. These gaps were filled with grout injected by the TBM, ensuring that all spaces between the concrete rings were sealed. This process resulted in a strong, waterproof tunnel structure. With the machines operating from both sides, Aligning the tunnels to meet at a precise central point was an incredibly challenging task. Advanced surveying techniques were employed to achieve this feat. These techniques involved creating triangular networks, utilizing a gyroscopic guidance system, integrating GPS and satellite data, and establishing reference points at sea level. The advanced surveying methods are a separate and detailed topic, which we will not delve into here. However, the results were astonishing. When the tunnels from both sides finally met, the error was just 2 centimeters, meaning 99.9% .9 of the alignment was perfectly accurate. When the tunnels on both sides were about to connect, precise coordination was required. The TBMs could not be brought too close to each other while drilling. To address this, the TBM on the UK side was stopped at a safe distance, while the TBM on the French side continued moving forward. A critical aspect of this phase was sealing the face of the UK side tunnel when retracting its TBM. Without sealing, the water pressure could have caused the tunnel to collapse. Similarly, when the French TBM approached the final connection point, careful control of its pressure was necessary to prevent the small remaining area from collapsing. After meticulous pressure management, the two tunnels were successfully connected in December 1990. At this point, the TBMs had completed their work and were permanently decommissioned, a process often referred to as mechanical suicide. Removing the TBMs from deep underground was cost prohibitive, so they were dismantled and buried on site. Some reusable parts of the machines were salvaged, but out of the 11 TBMs used for the project, five were permanently buried in the ground. Two crossovers were constructed inside the tunnel connecting both railway tunnels and providing access to the service tunnel. Under normal conditions, these crossovers are separated by large steel gates, but are designed to be used in emergency situations. After all, if the service tunnel is not connected to the railway tunnels, 
it cannot fulfill its purpose. To ensure access during emergencies, cross passages were built at intervals of 375 meters. These passages connect the railway tunnels to the service tunnel, allowing for effective emergency response. With the tunnel ready, the question arises, can a train operate efficiently in this tunnel? The answer is not straightforward. On open ground, a vehicle encounters drag force on its front side, which is distributed across both sides, allowing it to move forward. However, in a tunnel, this situation changes. Inside the tunnel, the drag force of the wind becomes dominant, significantly hindering the train's forward movement at high speeds. Additionally, this drag force can compromise passenger comfort, as the train essentially acts like a piston inside the enclosed space. To address this issue, piston relief ducts with a diameter of 2 meters were installed. These ducts allow air to flow through them when a train passes, distributing the air evenly to both sides of the tunnel. The only downside to these ducts is the flute-like sound they produce when a train is in motion. While noticeable, this sound does not affect the functionality or safety of the tunnel. Even after the tunnel was completed, several challenges arose in running the trains, with one of the most critical being the temperature inside the tunnel. When an electric train operates in the tunnel, the friction and motor heat cause the temperature to rise to 50 degrees Celsius, while air conditioners are installed in the trains for passenger comfort. This high temperature could lead to geological issues if not controlled. To address this, cooling systems were installed in both countries. These systems circulate cold water through pipes within the tunnel, reducing and maintaining its temperature at a manageable 35 degrees Celsius. Additionally, the service tunnel plays a vital role in ventilation as it supplies fresh air to the main tunnels and removes polluted air. In case of emergencies, several other safety systems have also been installed to ensure the well-being of passengers and operational integrity. The English Channel Tunnel stands as an extraordinary engineering marvel of the 20th century, showcasing how cutting-edge techniques can overcome the challenges of undersea construction. You can also support us by becoming a member of the channel. We hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. Don't forget to share your suggestions and feedback in the comments section below. Thank you for watching.